Hello, my name is Todd Rogers. I'm a professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Today we're going to be talking about a specific domain, voter mobilization, and how behavioral science can be applied to a specific problem, mobilizing voters, and the kind of progress that's possible after years of focus on it. I started as a political pollster, and I realized there was a science of behavior change that we weren't really using in politics. So I went to grad school, learned about this, and then went back to Washington and started a research institute with others, co-founded it, where we translated the insights of behavioral science into political strategy. We focused on things like donation, volunteerism, uh, resource allocation, and voter mobilization. Today we're going to be talking about just that one outcome. How do we maximize the impact of money spent on mobilizing voters we're going to see the kind of progress that's possible uh, as this field of behavioral science has been applied to this one problem. So to begin, here's a picture of me 10 years ago. I was volunteering for a campaign. I had a lot more hair. And I was making a phone call that was completely consistent with the norms of about a decade ago. I would begin the script by saying, hello, Mrs. Smith. It's easy to vote. The issues at stake are important. It's going to be close. So your vote matters, and it's your civic responsibility to vote. Do you intend to vote? Now, of course, she says, like everybody, 95% of people say this, yes, I intend to vote. So I say, great, thanks. Have a nice night. So that's the standard. That's the, the industry standard, the most common kind of message that was used up to about a decade ago. And if you unpack it, you can see that what we're really emphasizing are very rational variables. Things like, it's easy to vote, suggesting that the cost is low. It's important, the race is important, so if you have an impact, it's going to be high because the consequences are high. The, it's a close election, meaning you could be the pivotal voter, and it's your civic duty to vote. Now, if you unpack this, each of these is part of the rational voter model. What's fascinating is, up until about 2004, this was the most sophisticated kind of voter mobilization message. And experimentalists like Don Green and Alan Gerber at Yale ran randomized controlled experiments in the field testing different elements of these get out the vote scripts. They learned that emphasizing that it's easy has no effect on the impact of a voter mobilization message. Emphasizing that it's an important election, similarly, no effect. Emphasizing that you could be the pivotal voter, that it's a close election, no effect. Emphasizing it's your civic duty, no effect. And so what they concluded in this meta-analysis of many of these studies is that the content of what you say doesn't matter so much as the mode of contact. And what they found at the time was that the more personal, the more effective. Canvassing door-to-door -door is more effective than an impersonal robocall, things like that. So this is where the, the work of behavioral scientists and psychologists like myself and, in fact, Alan Gerber and Don Green also moved into this direction where we start testing psychological elements, behavioral elements that could be included into these scripts. We'll start with a project that I conducted with a collaborator named David Nickerson at Notre Dame. So what we have is the state of Pennsylvania in the 2008 primary election. So this is presidential election, Barack Obama versus Hillary Clinton. The presidential primary for the Democratic Party has not been resolved yet. We have a bunch of potential voters, about 300,000 of them. What we do is we randomly assign them to one of four different conditions. The first condition gets no contact at all, no phone call. They're the untreated control group. The second condition gets a standard voter mobilization script. It's important. Please vote. You can be the pivotal voter. The next group gets the standard plus do you intend to vote, just eliciting a commitment or an intention. And now the fourth gets the standard plus the intention plus a battery of questions designed to elicit a concrete plan. Do you intend to vote? Yes. What time will you vote? How will you get there? Where will you be coming from? So it's a very concrete set of questions. Now this is inspired by research in cognitive psychology on implementation intentions. People like Peter Golwitzer at NYU and others have worked on this for decades and they found that as you unpack the concrete details of an act, it makes you more likely to follow through on it for two reasons. One, you're more likely to just schedule it. It's pure mechanical scheduling. But the second, more sophisticated, interesting psychological piece is that 
when you unpack the concrete details, you say, oh, on Tuesday, I'm going to drop my kids off at school and then I'm going to go vote. That when, you, when that time arrives and you're driving home from dropping your kids off at school, it pops in your mind. It's just more likely because you've created the association between that context and the planned intention. So what we're going to do here is study what's the impact of adding that to a voter mobilization call. Whether you vote or not is public record. So this is the outcome measure we're going to be using. Many people don't realize that whether you vote, whether you show up or not, is public. Who you vote for, not public at all, 1892, federal law, secret ballot. But whether you vote is public. So what we find when we graph here the impact of these calls versus no call, we find that the people who receive the standard call, please vote, it's important, it's important, no, no effect. Just like dozens of other experiments, reminding people of an election is, has no meaningful effect, even though millions of dollars are spent on it. Asking them, do they intend to vote, eliciting a self-prediction, and this is the most sophisticated call as of 2008. Asking them to elicit a self-prediction, do you intend to vote, everybody says yes, has a small effect, a two percentage point effect. It's a real effect, uh, and other studies have sort of, are consistent with this. It's an effect, but it's about two percentage points. This is in line with other kinds of studies on voter mobilization phone calls without anything psychologically sophisticated in them. It might even be a little bit smaller than that, than those studies might suggest. But adding the plan making battery more than doubles the impact of what was at the time the most effective get out the vote call. So adding a plan making battery, this very small marginal cost addition can more than double the effect of a get out the vote phone call. So when I was talking to that woman, I should have added, Mrs. Smith, please remember, uh, what time will you vote? How will you get there? Where will you be coming from? That's one line of research that collaborators and I have worked on. Another looks at how do we emphasize, how should we emphasize the way turnout is going to be? Should we emphasize that not enough people are voting? You hear this a lot, not enough young people are voting, not enough low-income people are voting, etc. Or should we emphasize lots of other people are join, voting, so please join them? We, in 2004, I surveyed self-reported experts in voter mobilization, basically political consultants who work on voter mobilization, and they were roughly split 50-50 on which was more effective, emphasizing high turnout or emphasizing low turnout. And what we find across several experiments, this is with Alan Gerber at Yale, is that emphasizing high turnout is much more effective in motivating people to participate <clears throat> than emphasizing low turnout. We, we've seen this with self-reported intention to vote. We've seen this with click through on email uh, and across a lot of other behaviors. We've seen that, that people conform to the behavior of others. And I imagine that, um, that some of you are familiar with that. So when I was talking to Mrs. Smith, I should have also said, in addition to what time will you vote, how will you get there, where will you be coming from, I should have said, join the millions of others who are going to be voting. Turnout's going to be high, so please join the others emphasizing high turnout, even though, ironically, more people voting decreases the likelihood that you're going to be pivotal, but the likelihood that you're going to be pivotal is 1 in 10 million anyway. The likelihood that it's going to be a tie and your vote is going to be the difference is less than the likelihood that you're going to get hit by a car on your way to the polling place. So a, a third line of research explores the question of how do we deal with, uh, how, how should we emphasize, how should we refer to people? Should we refer to them as voters or as the kinds of people who can vote? And so the underlying principle here is that people have multiple identities. I'm a father, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. And when you elicit one identity, I'm more likely to behave in certain ways that are consistent with it than when I elicit another identity. So in this case, with Carol Dweck at Stanford and Greg Walton at Stanford and Chris Bryan, who is the lead author on this at UCSD, we did a series of experiments where we asked people to complete a survey in which all that we varied was whether we, we said to vote or to be a voter. So basically, a verb or a noun. So for example, we say, how important is it to you to vote in the tomorrow's election? In another condition, we say, how important is it to you to be a voter in tomorrow's election? So what we find is that emphasizing the voter identity is remarkably powerful in making people more likely to conform to that behavior. 
And we see this across a series of studies, uh, both in this noun verb format. We also see it in other studies where, it's, where we say as the kind of person who votes uh, versus as someone who can vote. So when I was talking to the Mrs. Smith, I should have also said, as the kind of person who votes, please be a voter in the upcoming election. Please be a voter in addition to make a plan and join lots of others. And now in very recent research that we are just now be in the process of publishing, and this is inspired by fascinating research that I encourage you all to look into uh, by Alan Gerber, Don Green, and Christian Larimer. Uh, that research showed that sending people their vote histories and their neighbors' vote histories and also sending their neighbors all that information, creating this sort of social pressure so that everyone knows who voted and who didn't, and then committing to after the election, we're going to send an update so everyone knows who voted and who didn't. Though it's incredibly creepy and elicits backlash in that people are very upset about it, incredibly powerful at increasing turnout. So what we're trying to do in this next study is really tease apart what is the impact of inducing accountability, the, the, the sense that you are going to have to talk to someone and have to potentially justify whether you voted or not. And so we have this most sophisticated psychological mailer, uh, which you can see on the screen, and it, and it basically uses all the principles. It has a pop-out box for make a plan. It emphasizes repeatedly as the kind of person who votes, as a voter. It emphasizes high turnout, all the, sort of, all the best practices. Um, and what it also does for half the people, and there are about 650,000 people in this experiment, we end up, for half of them, we send them this letter. And for the other half, and this is in the 2010 general election, for the other half, we add in the top right corner, uh, you may be called after the election to discuss your voting experience. Basically, this, this threat that you may be called, so it's supposed to create the sense that maybe you may have to explain to someone whether you voted or not. And we add a paragraph in which we also describe that. So what we find is that adding just this little call-out box and a paragraph reiterating it, basically saying, we may call you after the election, look out for our call, increases the effectiveness of that mailer by more than 40%. So we already have the most psychologically sophisticated mailer that we could develop. It uses all these best practices that we've learned from dozens or hundreds of experiments. And then we just add in the top right corner, we may call you after the election, and we reiterate it in the text, and that increases the effectiveness by more than 40%. So let's pull it all together. So when I was talking to Mrs. Smith, I should have said, what time will you vote? How will you get there? Where are you coming from? And also, lots of others would vote. You should join them. And also, you're the kind of person who votes. Thanks for being a voter. And also, this last bit about adding the prospect of accountability. Uh, we may call you after the election. Look out for our call. So what we see now in the 2012 election, this research was widely used. We, we think in total this probably doubles or triples the impact per dollar spent on voter mobilization. So there are tens of millions of dollars during the 2012 election spent on this activity. And what we're doing here is we're, we're, I'm now capturing as much of it as I can. And I want to see and I'm going to show you how some of it was used. So here's a mailer that I actually received saying this is the voter report card. You were a voter in the past. Please continue to be a voter. Be a voter this Tuesday. And it compares my turnout to others. So it basically says, lots of others are voting. You should join them. Even though your past vote history, which we're now looking at, uh, appears that you have voted less than others. This, just so everyone knows, this is an artifact of having moved and the, the registrar had not updated my voting record. There's no way my neighbors have voted more than me. Uh, just want to be clear, this is a data error. Nonetheless, it's fascinating that I received this treatment that, I, that I've learned has been mailed to literally millions of people in the 2012 election, this mailer, which emphasizes be a voter, join lots of others who are voting. This is an email from a national security organization called the Truman National Security Project. And if you unpack the messaging in it, it says lots of others are voting. Make sure you know where your, where your voting place is so it emphasizes make a plan. Uh, it emphasizes you're the kind of person who votes, uh, and so it emphasizes all three of those. It's a, it's a really sophisticated, and even the subject line is, uh, do you have a voting plan? So now, 
on the weekend before the election, a woman came knocking on my door volunteering for the uh, Elizabeth Warren campaign. And you can see her thumb in this image here. She came and she read me a script. It was fascinating. And it reflected all of this research. She's talking to me, asking me to make a plan, saying lots of others are going to vote, calling me a voter and the kind of person who votes. It was great. So afterwards, of course, I said, yes, and I do have a plan. I know when I'm going to vote. I know where I'm going to be coming from. I know how I'm going to get there. Thank you. And would you mind if I took a picture of your script and of your finger and your hand while you're doing it? So all I got was the tip of her finger, but this is a picture of the actual script that they were using for the Elizabeth Warren campaign. She won in the 2012 Senate race in Massachusetts against Scott Brown. Now here's an email that was sent several weeks before the election by the Obama campaign uh, to their email list in which they said, make a plan, and then they said, what time will you vote? How will you get there? Where will you be coming from? These are the specific questions we used in our research. So this is fantastic, and I presume that what they were going to do was email it back to me right before uh, the election day. Continuing with the Obama campaign, so this is the, uh, the weekend, the night before the election, it says, do you have a plan for tomorrow is the subject line. And as you read through it, you can see all the best practices we've been talking about. Now finally, this I really want to focus in on. Uh, this is the script from the Obama campaign's calling tool. So they had millions of calls made by volunteers delivered the, the week before the election, mobilizing other targets that the campaign had. So if you read this script, I, I called in, I logged in and made some phone calls, uh, and, I, and, I, and I took a picture of the script. This is the exact script they use, and as you unpack it, you can see each of these things. It says, I'm calling because records show that you voted in 2008. Uh, we're reminding voters like you. If you keep reading it, it says, uh, we've talked to a lot of people in your town today who are planning to vote. This election is going to be close and we really need your vote. But they've talked to a lot of people who are going to vote. I have your polling place listed as this and that the hours are this. I know everyone is busy, so what time do you plan to vote? Next question. Will you be heading there from work or somewhere else? Basically, this is, let's elicit a plan. And, and then finally, do you need a ride? Ba the goal of that question, of course, they're, they're, in, they're ingratiating themselves, offering, we'll give you a ride, but they're also prompting the target to make a plan. So contrast that script with the Romney script. So I, I made calls, I, saw, I used the call-in tool to capture the scripts for both campaigns to see what people were saying. And as you can see here on the screen, the Romney script did not reflect any of the published, widely available behavioral research that has been proven to double and triple the impact per dollar spent on voter mobilization. I found this baffling, I, and I don't come at this as I'm presenting this from a partisan perspective. It was just surprising as someone who does research and publishes this research to find that the Obama campaign internalized this behavioral science to maximize its impact when communicating to voters. And the Romney campaign apparently didn't use any of it. But that said, the research in total has made a, a ton of progress in about a decade of, of focus. So with dozens and hundreds of experiments, focused on how do we translate behavioral science into strategies to increase voter turnout. We've made substantial progress, make a plan, emphasize high turnout, emphasize the voter identity, introduce the prospect of post-election accountability. And, we, and we've, from this problem of increasing turnout, we've managed to really build a, a set of tools and best practices that have made voter mobilization efforts substantially more effective, which increase participation in elections. In the end, this is about increasing representative representation and increasing participation. And it's publicly available research. Now, thank you. Please vote. If you want to learn more, this is my website. And I also think if you are interested in this research, here's a list of other political scientists who work on voter mobilization and do fascinating work, and also a list of my collaborators on this research. Thank you.